Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right, now we're ready to go. Welcome to the College of DuPage 2018 Black History Month panel discussion. Yeah, you can clap. That's all right. This will be an interactive session, an interactive discussion, a time for teaching and learning. And it will focus on the national theme for the month, which is African Americans in times of war. Now, we will explore some contributions and efforts of African Americans and how they have pursued life, liberty, and happiness in times of war and in times of peace. I have a really wonderful assignment right now, and that is to introduce the moderator for this panel discussion. Our moderator is a champion in her own right. Not only is she the first woman president of the College of DuPage, but she is also the second woman ever to achieve the rank of Vice Admiral in the Navy. Additionally, she has held numerous positions, including Deputy Commander of the United States Transportation Command in Illinois, Pentagon Director, Chief of Staff for the United States Navy Staff, Commander of the Naval Service Training Command at Great Lakes, Illinois, as well as other staff and commanding responsibilities with policy, support, and student service. She is leading the college with several great and new initiatives, and I'm excited that she accepted to be the moderator, and we are proud to have her with us for this session. So won't you join me in welcoming the president of College of DuPage, Dr. Ann Rondo. Well, good afternoon. We are, we are actually, you are part of the inaugural of what we're going to have every February during Black History Month, a panel on a topic that is important to the country at that time. We have you know, our first panel today some great guests, and I, will, we, and I will have each of them introduce themselves in a moment. But the, but the theme, as David has said, is about African Americans in times of war. It's important to understand that that title is allowing us a conversation about how wartime or those kinds of events affect those who are in the military and their observations. But it also is the case that in any given day in, in the United States military, only about 10 percent of the military is actually ever engaged in combat. Everybody else is doing IT, medicine, logistics, cyber, intelligence, finance, and all the things that go to support a military of the size of the United States. So what you'll hear is experiences from people who were able to watch and observe, but none of us have actually been in combat, but we have had many different observations of those of our colleagues who have been. So with that start, uh, at the table, you're going to see some faces that you know. The first one, though, the first uh, guest that we have, and I will have her introduce her, herself, is our outside guest coming all the way from Madison, Wisconsin. I like her a lot because she roots for the Packers. <laughs> But, <laughs> but I want to be sure that each of our guests has a chance to introduce uh, him, herself, or herself. But truly, for our first guest, let's give Major General Marsha Anderson a round of applause and welcome. <laughs> so um, would you please start and let us know a bit about yourself, General. Thank you, Dr. Rondeau. Uh, thank you all for coming. I see some people who are standing in the back of the room, and I think I see seats up front. So feel free to move forward if you want to. It's like church. Come it's on up front. Church. Come <laughs> on up front. <laughs> Don't be shy. Come on up front. Thank you. Um, as uh, Dr. Rondeau indicated, I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. I was born in Beloit. Um, and I spent the better part of my life uh, growing up in East St. Louis, Illinois. So some of you may know a little bit about East St. Louis. Um, 
And just very briefly, my career in the Army spanned over 30, almost 37 years. And it, <laughs> and it, I can teach you that later. Um, and it, it culminated with my assignment at the Pentagon. I was there on active duty, even though I was in the reserves. A lot of us, as you know, ended up on active duty. I was assigned to the Pentagon for three years. Uh, at the end of my career, I was the Deputy Chief Army Reserve which meant I was the second um, highest person in the Army Reserve responsible for our programs um, in the Pentagon, dealing with Congress, and a lot of outreach. Um, and I guess we'll talk a little bit later about how we came to be in the military, yeah, but yeah, I'll, I'll we'll leave that. that for later. But I really am very grateful to be with you today, and I hope that I'll be able to um, answer some questions and dispel some myths. Great, thank you. Tanika. Hi, my name is Tanika Moore. Um, I'm a student here at COD. Um, I joined the military in 2016. Um, I'm from the West Side of Chicago. I moved out here when I was in eighth grade. I graduated from West Chicago High School, and I'm a student at COD. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. Okay. Dr. Davis. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Felix Davis. I'm a professor in the CIT department here uh -huh. at College of DuPage. Served in the one and only Army. We'll let the general slide. Uh, bears go. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, having served in the military army has prepared me for some things that we'll be talking about today. So I look forward to an engaging conversation this morning. Thank you. Mr. Neal. Uh, good morning, uh, Sherman Neal. I'm a retired naval officer, was a commander in the Navy, came in back in 1979, um, retired as a commander, drove ships, carriers, cruises, a bunch of things throughout the world, and uh, was a banker here for about 15 years. Now I'm an entrepreneur, I'm president of a constr local construction company, and I'm also the president of the foundation board here at the college. Okay, Mr. James. Good morning, my name is Peter James. I'm a professor of business and entrepreneurship here on the College of DuPage. Uh, my military history, uh, eight years as an officer, medical service corps officer in the United States Army. Uh, a tour over in Afghanistan a couple of months after 9-11. And wow, the experiences, I could go on for hours, but I was told beforehand that we don't have hours. <laughs> so therefore, I'll pass the baton back to Dr. Rendo. Thank you, Peter. So I, I wanted to, now what you've got here is a span of people who have served from the, Viet, from the end of the Vietnam era all the way through to Afghanistan, Iraq, and the current time. And you have one, of course, our student who is in the Army Reserves now. So th there's, a, there's, a, there's a spanning of experience here that is really important. But uh, General, as you th think about what, uh, what you did and how you came into the Army, could you sh share with us some of the things that, that you learned from that and what you might want to tell us about your leadership principles? Okay. Thank you. Um, a lot of the things that I learned in the military truly shaped who I am today. Um, I went through the Reserve Officer Training Program at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, and that, that gave me a taste of the leadership opportunities that the military offered. First and foremost, I was a very shy young woman. I would, I would freak out before my speech class when I had to give a three-minute speech. But the military does a lot of, of explaining to you, a lot of preparing you, a lot of mentoring. And through that, I was able to gain a lot of confidence. And it, it taught me a couple of things. One, that you know, even if you walk into the room um, and you've got a, a, a bunch of degrees, that doesn't necessarily mean you're the smartest person in the room. And I say that because I would not be who I am today without the non-commissioned officers. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, those would be chief petty officers or not called our non-commissioned officers. Sergeants and senior airmen are non-commissioned officers. They are not, they are the backbone of our services. They comprise the majority of the people who are in our military. And I learned from them a lot. I learned how to be humble, number one. But I also learned the importance of asking the people that you serve, because even though I was you know, on paper the leader, I asked the people that I served with, how would you solve this problem? What do you think we should do? And nine times out of 10, they had a great idea and a great approach. So my leadership style kind of evolved from that, is that I learned to trust the people that I was responsible for to help me solve problems, as opposed to thinking I was the best and brightest and the smartest in the room. 
one of the things that we had talked about, uh, General, was was uh, your reflections on mentorship and what your mentors meant to you, uh, kind of what I would call the difference uh, from throwing somebody the, at the deep end of the pool and walking away and the ones who will walk alongside while you, while you learn. Could you talk a little bit about, about that, about mentoring and about coaching and what that meant to you? Yeah. Um, most, as they say, say, all of my mentors, about 99% of my mentors were white males because that was what the officer corps of the military is primarily comprised of. And they kind of picked me. I didn't even know what a mentor was. And in many cases, I, don't, I didn't even realize until years later that this person had been mentoring me. But they had asked me what I wanted to do. Um, they sometimes were instrumental in making sure I was given challenging assignments, but they also made themselves available to me if I needed to, to talk to somebody and, and have someone act as a sounding board. And in many cases, my mentors may have also been my boss. And if, if I failed at a, at, a, at a project, they didn't publicly shame me about it. They would simply say to me, look, I probably didn't explain that to you well enough. I'll take the heat for that. But, they, but if I did very well, they would make sure that I got public praise and recognition. So that taught me how to mentor people, that you sometimes have to select them. They don't always self-select. And it's important as a mentor to, to provide people with room to grow, let them make mistakes. Also make sure, though, that you, know, you don't set them up for failure. You always try to set them up for success. Thank you. Um, you come, Ms. Moore, with a different kind of experience and background. But it's interesting what you and I had, had talked about. And, and I'm uh, also thinking about the general. Let us know a little bit about how you came into the Army and then what it means to you as a young woman to be in the Army. Um, OK. Um, so um, I wanted to join the Army in high school, but that just didn't, I was just like, probably not. No, I'm not going to do it. So then, um, <laughs> so I came to COD, um, I studied um, criminal justice, and like, like my life was, it was in 2016, no, 2015, 2016, and I was just really having a rough patch in my life. I was on my own, I moved out. Um, things weren't just going so well for me, like my life was falling apart, and I knew my life was falling apart, and I knew I was a reckless human being, and I just decided one day that I needed discipline in my life, so like the best option was to join the army. Um, sorry, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> um, it just um, so 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 one of of the things that you talked about was that as as a woman, you felt as though you you could do pretty much what guys do, right? And that uh, there were no boundaries for you in uh, the army. You want to you want to can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah. I'm um, sorry. It's okay. It's it's okay. Well, are you wanting us to, to come back to you? Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Dr. Davis, you are one of our faculty here. Yeah. And so talk about how you came to, to the Army. And you've got a, a notion about this that is um, a sense about what you also owed your sons. Yes, ma'am. The, the interesting part, this young lady and I are both from the west side of Chicago. So in that mentality, in that vein, being brought up in the inner city of Chicago, there's a certain mentality. My parents were from Tupelo, Mississippi, and Fulton, Mississippi, very small towns and rural. So they have a mindset based on their life experiences as well. So the discipline component, what's interesting is this young lady and I are from the different spectrum is I had plenty, too much discipline growing up. <laughs> if you ask me, uh, I got a whooping for everything. So. <laughs> So when I entered, <laughs> when I entered the military, the discipline component wasn't an issue for me. I knew how to follow rules and regulations and uh, do the things that I needed to do. But what the military brought to the table was how to be a disciplined person in a more formalized manner, how to be a leader, how to be a good follower. You know, I didn't understand those things, understanding the dynamics of my decisions and the impact of those decisions amongst others, my peers. Uh, my father, having grown up in a segregated Mississippi, kind of influenced me in a way that wasn't the best at that time, because that's what he knew and how he understood. The military opened the door to help me understand and see other people's life stories as well. And we began to grow in uh, camaraderie that I would have never, ever expected. So that kind of component. And that led me to a point in life where, you know what, I wanted to be able to establish a perspective that I can do anything, and I wanted to, to demonstrate it for my children. 
So it led me to pursuing not only a military career, a corporate career, and eventually education, pursuing a doctor degree. Not that I needed it as a business manager in corporate. I just wanted to show my two children, my boys, that, you know what, if they can get a doctor degree, so can you. So one of the things about, about, about combat units and about the military is what you've heard Dr. Davis say and what you're going to hear Tanika say in a minute. This is, and what you heard the general say. There's, a, there's an ethos about taking care of each other, about obligations to each other. You're accountable for yourselves, but you owe others. And that kind of growing happens, and you watch it either from a distance, and you see great units do it, or you are part of it, and you also feel that. So you heard the general, and you heard Dr. Davis. One of the things that... Danica and I had talked about was a whole notion of battle buddies. You want to talk? You want to? You want want to to discuss that? Yeah. Um, so like as a private, I'm like the lawyer enlisted, and like um, <laughs> our our whole our whole like like they drill this into you since basic training is battle buddies. It's like um, cause like um, I guess the military like it's like this thing called sharp, and like it's like a um, sexual harassment um, prevention thing. Prevention. Yeah. And um, they, it's they they you have to depend on your battle buddy in a way like say like your uniform's messed up or like your name tapes like messed up your battle buddy has to have your back fix you up and you know ha like always you have to be ready like your battle buddy has to be there you have to be with your battle buddy twenty four seven they don't like you being alone in the military in the army pretty much um, like if you're messed up if your battle buddy messed up it's your responsibility to attend to each other. And they drill this in, like, they drill this into you, like, since basic training till now. Thank you very much. So, um, Mr. Neal, um, and, I, and you know, for those of you who, who don't know, Sherman is the president of our college foundation, and so a very important leader for the college. Uh, why don't you tell us a bit, a bit about how you came in into the Navy and your notion about how that battle buddy concept also fits into the larger context of the military history that, about which you study so much? Um, I don't get paid as a president of the foundation either. No, he does not get paid as president Just of the foundation. He um, gets all of our gratitude, so everybody give him a round of applause, all right? <laughs> um, I, I grew up in the rural south, um, South Carolina. Um, I grew up in a family of 13 children, uh, well, 12 brothers and sisters. So by the time I applied to and went to the Naval Academy, and you know, it's an extremely uh, difficult school, to, extremely uh, high, dis high level of discipline. You know, it was like a four year vacation for me compared to what my mother did to me. <laughs> um, so um, I, I say, I'd say uh, my experience as I came out of the rural South was uh, I was, I, I did fairly well academically. Um, and I, you know, she did well at Annapolis as well. Um, but I was the kind of person who was very internally focused. Uh, being a leader in the military is, is, is the complete opposite of that. It's not about you, it's about the people you lead and the people that you serve. Um, so I, I, my intention was when I went to Annapolis was to do a couple years there. I studied engineering and mathematics and I was going to transition to uh, Howard University and study uh, naval architecture. Um, but, you know, my dreams got sort of uh, diverted on the way, um, given that I wasn't a quitter and no one else there was. But nonetheless, it required me to change. Um, and there are two significant aspects of that change. The one was to, to take on the mantle that I wanted to serve the country. Um, notwithstanding my background and experiences, um, th the second one was that in order to be a leader, you can't lead people who you don't know, and you can't expect people to follow you as a leader if they don't know you. So it became this inherent um, adaptation of my personality to be a little bit more going on the one hand, but most importantly to trust people whose background was different than mine, uh, whose experiences were different than mine. You know, my, my roommate was a a uh, blue-eyed blonde guy from Butte, Montana, named Alexander Ulysses Grant Sharp. 
interestingly, <laughs> Alex, his, his father, his grandfather was a three-star admiral in the Pacific Fleet during World War II. His father was an admiral. And so, so Sharpie was expected as well to, uh, to, um, to move up the ranks as well. You know, I came from, my father had a seventh grade education. You know, my mother had an eleventh grade education. So we came into this environment, you know, joined to the hip because it required, you know, teamwork and required uh, both of our of self-support in order to make it through a, a fairly difficult program. And that was the beginning of my change. And that was sort of the beginning of my new concept of what, I guess, what you might see what it means to have a battle buddy. And interestingly, you know, I changed significantly, obviously, but when I became a commission officer at 23 years old, and I my, was driving, air, I'd say driving aircraft carriers, uh, running ships for the Navy, uh, East Coast, out into Mediterranean, you know, I was always the, the, the outside guy from a color perspective. But that didn't really matter to me because what ended up happening was I had already went through the change. I had already became extremely comfortable with who I was and my t the talents I bought, you know, my experiences um, and my professionalism as a naval officer. But I, so I generally led guys who didn't look like me. They were white guys generally, uh, or I had guys from the west side. Um, but I became, so inherently, you know, as a leader, um, my role became to sort of bring all these disparate forces together from varying backgrounds, um, various interpretations of the world, very, various reasons why they even joined the military, and sort of make them a cohesive force focusing on the mission that, that we are going to accomplish. So going back to your point is this whole concept of, of battle buddies is that, you know, relative to the military is that, you know, you all saw it in the same bucket. You know, you all joined at the, at the hip, and, um, and the success that I experienced as a, as a military officer and observing 22 years um, in active and reserve service um, was the ability to sort of work with peoples of all varying backgrounds and influences, um, irrespective of uh, what they thought about you or what I thought about them, quite frankly. Thanks, Sherman. That was a long time. Peter, you have a, a bit of a different experience, but one of the things that you had spoken about quite a bit was that when you were in the Army, the education that the Army was giving was a bit ahead of what you thought you might have for access uh, otherwise. You want to talk about that a little bit? And, sure. and, and, and first of all, what, what you did in the Army? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so first of all, um, I, I was a Medical Service Corps officer for the United States Army. Um, and even to piggyback on the entire battle buddy yeah. conversation, you know, I was born single mom, uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, only child. One thing I really take away from the military, the Army specifically, was that the Army was, uh, and the military is a precursor to teamwork. I always tell my students that we can't accomplish anything in society, in life, without the help of others. The military taught me that as an only child. I didn't realize that I needed somebody, my battle buddy next to me, to succeed, to take that next objective, to accomplish that goal. And all of you, none of us can do it by ourselves. We all need somebody. It was very much a lesson for me. Yes, the education that it provided me was outstanding, and even the, uh, the allowance of paying for my, help pay for my college. Again, my mom couldn't do it for me by any means. So now I've learned to rely, I've learned to actually take away from the military that, that same fact. So now as you apply it after the military, into your careers, into your objectives, into your goals, into your own businesses, you can't do it by yourself. You need a battle buddy next to you. You need somebody to take you to whatever promised land you're trying to get to. And I have to really attribute the United States Army for that, to help me with that. Thanks, Peter. That was well said. So one of the things that Frederick uh, Douglass had talked about was the importance of being in the military as an act of citizenship. General, I wonder if, if you might uh, start, but I'd like to have you all just kind of have a free-form dialogue here. Is You said that your father said that, that um, citizens should take citizenship seriously. Um, more or less, could you could you start up this dialogue and do a uh, free form about what what being in the military has meant to a depth of understanding about being in this country as citizens and citizen activism in a very confident manner? 
Um, well, the first thing is, you know, there's over 300 million plus people in our, in our country, but less than 2% of us either have personally served in the military or even know someone in the military. And, and I, I was talking to someone earlier uh, about this. You know, I've given lots of people the oath. I've, I've, I'm sorry, I did do basic training. I hope it was a good experience for you. <laughs> um, but uh, I was in command of a unit for that. But, but when you give people the oath, and they get to the part in the oath where you say, I, I swear that I will protect and defend the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That's a sobering moment for people. I think that says what it means to serve, what it means to be an American. Um, and I've had people start to cry when they, when, they start to, when they get to that part. I had a young lady, I almost couldn't finish. I was swearing her in as an as a Air Force lieutenant. And I said, she said, I said, it's OK, because that means you get it. You know why you're doing this. And you know who you're doing it for. Um, and to, to get to the, the earlier point, none of us can get anywhere without each other. And that's what has made us unique, I think, as a, as a country and certainly as our military is we're kind of a melting pot. And we've kind of been an experiment for over 200 and some odd years in this country. And I think mostly it's going pretty well. And we've had some rough, rough patches. But I think that service in the military kind of brings a lot of that together for me. It brought a lot together for me, I should say. And the, the people that I was able to interact with and the people who, yeah, a lot of them will say, I came in for the GI Bill. But you know, 15 years later, they've already got their college degree and their master's degree, and they're still there. So there must be another reason that they're there. And it's because they value the opportunity to demonstrate by serving that they are full citizens. So, Tanika, you take the same oath as, as the general, and as did I. That's kind of cool, huh? Yeah. So, what, so what's that mean for you as, as a voice in America based upon your military experience? Does that, does that give you a, a, a larger sense of confidence about, about what, you, what, you, what, what, you, what you can offer to, to the nation as, as a citizen, as, as a leader? Um, yeah, I, like for me joining the, um, the army, I take, like, I'm, I'm very proud, like, I'm very proud I served in the army. Um, for me, I feel like it's like a, a really big team, you know, like you're part of a really great big team. And like we're out there conquering, well, we're not conquering things, but like, you know. I mean, like, we're like, I don't know, I feel, I'm very prideful. Like, I just feel like I'm, like, I contribute to like society in some type of way. Like, you know, some people are like, oh, I'm going to make a change, but they never do. But I feel like, like for me right now, I feel like I'm making a change since I'm in the army. That's that's cool. So Peter, so if you pick up on on that, one of the things that the general had said to me was, you could airdrop an army unit into any city in the world, and they could run the water, they could run the banks, they could make a city happen, because that's what the, what the U.S. Army does. Can you talk a little bit about about that? aspect of the army in the terms of what it does around the world when people might have not only war but there are there is hunger there is uh there are hurricanes there are earthquakes that the united states army can can airdrop in and in a virtual city you want to you want to and with you being part of the medical corps you know uh, about that could you talk about that a little bit sure um interesting question actually uh, when i was in one of the things that we prided ourselves on as an army, and many of you probably know this, you might ask a question, why does the United States always feel like they have to go where they weren't invited or go fight these battles? Here's a little bit of explanation why. Our force is one of the few forces in the world that takes care of their soldiers, sailors, and everybody who's in the military. What I mean by take care of them is, in the battlefield, we are well fed. We have the best medical care. We have the best logistics and best supplies. Nine times out of 10, maybe even seven times out of 10, the army that we're fighting or the other the avenues that we're taking to get there, the, the opposition does not have the resources that we have, which is why we usually prevail. So even if it's a humanitarian mission, humanitarian mission where we're going to help refugees in a certain part of the world, or going to assist um, bring water to a certain part of the world, we have the capabilities to be able to do it better than any other country in the world. Does that mean we need to be everywhere? Probably not. But if not us, 
Then who? Who else? Thank you. So now, Sherman, to take that up one more level, you are a great student of military history. You've studied a lot. And, uh, and I would say that in this room, you might be the most learned in military history. You, you talk about the economic aspects of our country and the African-American military experience from the days of the Revolution through the Civil War, through, through the War of 1812 and the Navy and the Civil War, all the way up to modern America. Would you, would you give us a, a sense of your thoughts that might be helpful to us today to understand the economic aspects of African-Americans in the military? Well, um, I wasn't in the War of 1812, <laughs> but, but nonetheless, um, I, I have studied uh, military history uh, a fair amount. I'm certainly not a historian, um, and, I, and I'll say one thing back to your point um, when you talk about patriotism. The, the military doesn't have a m monopoly on patriotism, uh, neither does those who serve necessarily. Um, I think anybody can be patriotic to the country if their efforts are focused on moving the country forward. And that's whether you serve in the military, and I've got friends who are to the right of Attila the Hun politically, and I got friends who are to the left of uh, Gloria Steino. You know, they're all patriots. And then, so I just want to make that point. But, you know, I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, back in 1947, uh, 40, 1944, um, prior to the uh, modern uh, civil rights era, just to give you some idea of the impact of the military on social justice in this country um, as it relates to uh, Black History Month, there, there was a young man um, who uh, 11 years before 1955 and Rosa Parks was uh, uh, effectively was a catalyst for the Mon Montgomery boycott. There was a second lieutenant who got on a bus in what was then called Camp Hood, Texas. Yeah. And they said, go to the back of the bus. He was a serving active duty second lieutenant. And he got into a confrontation with the bus driver. And he said, I'm not going to the back of the bus. There are seats here on the front, effectively. So he got court-martialed. Um, he got court-martialed. His uh, representative at the time was a young man named Thurgood Marshall. So Thurgood Marshall represented him. Nonetheless, he lost the case. Um, he subsequently, uh, he received some sort of corporal punishment, and I think uh, was ameliorated to the point where, you know, um, he didn't have to serve any time. But ultimately, as a result of that, he got out of the military. Um, and I'll tell you who he is in one minute. But the second piece of that is um, he was serving in, I believe, the 761st Tank Battalion, yes. which was an old black tank battalion um, which uh, received high decorations uh, during World War II, serving under the French. Another long story. But nonetheless, this guy's name, this second lieutenant's name was, was, uh, was Jackie Robinson. So when you think about the history of this country, and, and the people and the institutions, how it manifests itself, there's not a whole lot of new history here. Um, Jackie Robinson, I guess, for lack of better terms, probably did the first modern day bus uh, sit in, you might say. He sat where he shouldn't have sat. He was court martialed as a result of that, far in excess of the time that Rosa Parks did that in 1955. And then, of course, Jackie Robinson, you know, integrated Major League Baseball. Uh, it was in 19, uh, 1947, 47, yeah. 1947. So, you know, he was a second lieutenant in the military. You know, he, he was a historical figure more known for uh, baseball than it is for necessarily for his military service. Um, so, I, you know, I look at, you know, young men and women nowadays, you know, you take um, like LeBron James and those who, who speak up as, a, as I think they should on social issues um, as big sports figures and as Muhammad Ali did, you know, there are folks who preceded them who sort of set the stage for their ability to speak out and, and to some extent gave them the courage, you know, as a 
you know, when I went into Annapolis uh, back in 1979, or actually I matriculated in 1980, you know, they had roughly no more than a couple hundred blacks who had graduated from the school in the history of the school, you know, and I thought I was setting precedence. I really wasn't. I was just, you know, stepping on the shoulders of these, you know, great heroes before me. You know, going back to, if I don't want to expand on it too much, but I'll, I'll tell you another story, and I'll, I won't monopolize a panel, right? <laughs> because, because I think it's important to understand, you know, why things aren't, why things are the way they are today based on how things happened uh, years ago. Um, I think it was back in 1941, there was a 369th um, Infantry Division out of New York, right? It was an all-black di division. At the time, the military was still very much segregated, um, but they wanted to fight. They were deployed. At the time, blacks were not uh, allowed to deploy, and certainly not at integrated combat units, but to fight, period. And so what the, what the United States Army did was they put them under the command of the French. It was the first time, and I believe the last time in military history, that a U.S. combat unit has operated on a foreign command. The 369th distinguished themselves under the French. And as a unit, and I'm certain individually, they were awarded, you know, uh, the Legion of Merit, the highest uh, honor in the, in the French uh, military, which is still very high today. So a lot, I, I say that to say in a roundabout way that, you know, um, sometimes our, our act of defiance, whether you're in the military or not, that in of itself speaks to your patriotism, just as it is for you to go and sign on the bottom line. Good. Thank you, and Felix. Um, you talked a little about um, how the how the army teaches competency, just professional competency. Could you talk about that and what you saw of your fellow soldiers, and then what you see today in terms of what that means really to the economic and financial su success? And and I'll come back to you, Sherman, on the economic issues also. But could you talk about that, Felix? Sure. From a from a patriotism perspective, I'm gonna be pretty transparent. I wanted some money. <laughs> I joined strictly to get college money. That was it. I was, uh, I'm the first descendants of a, a family, mother and father, that were uh, from sharecropping, from uh, segregation in the South. There was no patriotic act in me joining the military. But I tell you, it changed my life. I had no perspective of collaborating and working with those outside of my immediate family. And that was being instilled into me day by day uh, between my father and my uncle was that, hey, trust no one. You need to be able to manage and make it on your own. Education was instilled into me as the key to success. Nothing about collaboration, patriotism, or teamwork. But upon joining the military, I got a huge insight to those uh, benefits and those type of things. Uh, my MOS was called 31 Foxtrot. When I joined the military, I went in on a buddy-buddy program. Me and a buddy from the neighborhood was going to get out of the neighborhood and go get some college money. We took a test. The results came back, and they said, okay, buddy-buddy, Felix, you did very well. Roosevelt, it don't look good. <laughs> <laughs> they told us we qualified for infantry. Now, I knew enough, I knew what that meant, and all of a sudden, we were not buddies anymore. <laughs> and the recruiter told me about a brand new MS called 31 Foxtrot, which was a mobile secure network wireless engineer, setting up mobile secure networks in remote areas. And that's where the formal discipline and education came into play, being able to understand that my decisions not only impacted me, that I had other lives that depended on my decisions, that if I did not set that network up properly, if it was not secured, that I could cost not just lives, thousands of lives. So that component and the uh, professionalism, the patriotic component of it became instilled in me, infused with the discipline that my parents had gave me. So that, that was a very beneficial and uh, most impactful component of my military career. Yeah, of course. Um, I just want to kind of touch on the 
you know, I think we have a similar story. I, I joined because I needed college credits. It had nothing to do with the flag at that point. But, <laughs> um, but you talked about the economic um, advantages of people joining the military. Number one, it was the opportunity for a lot of people to enter the middle class. Because after the GI Bill, and people took advantage of that, a lot of um, people who served in the military who were African American were able to get degrees and to then improve their lives for their families. Um, as we were talking on the phone about this program, I said, well, people also don't seem to remember that one of the first places people of color could get paid the same as everyone else around them who was performing the same job and at the same rank was the military. The same was true for women. For women, yeah. for women in particular, the, if I was sitting next, if I was sitting next to a general in the Pentagon at the same rank and the same time, number of years I had, I knew down to the penny that we were both making how much we were both making. Yep. You can't say that for so many other um, occupations in this country. You can walk into a bank and see two people with the title of vice president, and I bet you if people were honest and they told you, there'd be a disparity in their in their salaries. So for a lot of people who of color who served in the military, particularly African Americans, it was an opportunity to get equal pay for the same work. Yeah, no, I think that's, that, that is really true. Yeah. E equal pay for equal work, right? Let oh, me, let oh, me ask him, because no, if no. he start talking, I ain't going to get no more time. No, no, but I'm going <laughs> to... Go ahead, I'm Felix. Gonna and it's going to take 10 Go seconds. Go ahead, Felix. Wait. And, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll make a point. I'm, I'll make a point, because in uh, about 1864, and, and I'm not a military historian. I just <laughs> read things, right? No, but in 1864, black Union soldiers used to make 10 bucks per month. Right. White Union soldiers used to make 13 bucks per month. And I believe Congress passed a law yeah. so that blacks and white soldiers made the same. Made the same money. So the military yep. was sort of uh, leading the charge in um, equal pay based on uh, what you did for a living. Peter, did you have something? Yeah, I'm going to jump in before Felix does, too. <laughs> Actually, the military has been a trendsetter, a trailblazer for a lot of racial disparities historically. Right. If you yep. think about it, after World War II, a lot of the African-American soldiers would come back to a lot of discrimination and stereotyping when they came back. And part of the reason I came in was because also I was able to make a gr better salary than I was even outside of the military after college. I went in as an officer and they were paying me. I couldn't believe it. I had to go. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, so go ahead, Felix. From okay, a, Felix. From an economic standpoint, my story is the opposite. Uh, the military equipped me with an awesome education in the field of IT and wireless network and communication, security. And when I found out what the civilian world was paying, I got out. <laughs> <laughs> well, now there not you go. <laughs> not, only, not only that. But there were unhidden, there were hidden economic benefits to me that I did not even know about. Because I was from the west side of Chicago and I joined in Illinois, when I exited, I came back because IBM offered me money to come to Chicago thinking that I wasn't from Chicago because I never told them. <laughs> so they offered me benefit packages, uh, home rent. You would not believe it. But here's the part that I did not know. When I got back to Illinois, did some research, I qualified for something called IVG, Illinois Veterans Grant, which qualified me to attend any Illinois state-funded school for free. Still so, still, yeah, and it's yeah, still in use today. Yeah, still, still so yeah. now leveraging that formal education that the military provided me, earning degrees while in the active duty military, and then upon exiting, I was able to leverage the IVG to continue education in other areas that I had not even thought about. So there's huge, there were huge economic, it was life changing for me. That's great, thanks. Um, General and Tanika, I both asked you a question and you both gave me a similar answer in different words. Uh, so I'm gonna start with the general. Uh, I asked what were your biggest obstacles and you talked about self-inflicted wounds and then um, Tanika, you talked about uh, about just inner inner what what the army gave you for an inner sense of determination. So, General, could you start about that? What this and the the topic is what were the biggest obstacles? Okay, I think um, for me the biggest obstacles were, were pretty much myself. It was a lack of um, confidence that I could do certain um, jobs or that I could um, uh, learn certain skills. Um, one of the biggest confidence builders for me was um, I saw these guys walking around and they had these, you know, I'll just I'll call them Boy Scout badges on their uniforms is what I used to call them. But they, they had these badges and stuff. And I said, well, what, what is this one over here for? Well, it's I went to parachute school. And I said, 
what's it take to go to parachute school? They said, well, there's a test. You got to be able to run, you know, a certain number of miles and a certain number of minutes and da 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 da, and do a number of pull ups and push ups and things. And I said, okay. So I basically decided I was going to go to airborne school and get parachute qualified. I am not a big fan of heights. <laughs> I will tell you that I can barely go to a football stadium. I can't look behind me because I think I'm going to fall. So, so I literally made myself go to, um, to uh, airborne training at Fort, ben Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, I called my dad after I'd been there for three days to break the news to him because he thought I had lost my mind because he was in the, he was, he started in the Korean War and they made him do a practice jump just because. Um, but I got myself parachute qualified and it's not like I needed that to advance in the Army, but it was a real confidence builder that I could, I could learn to do something like that that was very scary, very foreign to me, um, but the, again, the military, you know, they provide you with the training so that when they actually tell you, as they say, stand in the door, it's one of the jump master commands, I remember that, you actually say, of course, I can do this, I'm not going to die. You could, obviously, but they have, they have convinced you to the point where you know, I am indestructible, I can do this. And um, to this day, I, I remember that, that training experience and what it felt like to jump out of that airplane. Um, I haven't done it since. Um, <laughs> but, but it was a big confidence builder. But we also didn't have everybody who was in that training program, male and female, had the same standards. We had to do the same things to become qualified. And, and that, was, that was also a very important thing for me to experience um, with, my, with my fellow soldiers. And unfortunately, I was one of the senior people in that group, so I got to do a lot of leadership stuff while I was there, in addition to trying to just learn how to jump out of an airplane. But again, it was all a, a, a confidence builder and a great exercise, and I've never forgotten that experience. Great, thank you. And after Tanika, we're going to open this up for uh, questions and answers from all of you. So Tanika, could you also talk about the greatest obstacles and, you, and the sense that you gave me about, it's, it's all about what's in, what's in your heart? Yeah. Um, so, like, like I said, when I joined the Army, I was, I was, like, on my, you know, rock bottom. So, like, I had, like, a lot of emotional challenges in basic training. Like, when I joined, I was, like, I fell out with my family and stuff like that. So I really didn't talk to them. Like, I didn't ask for their approval to join the Army. I just did it. So, like, um, um, like when, during basic training, like, it was really hard because, like, in the beginning, like, you watch everybody get letters and stuff like that. They used to call out names, and I used to just sit there. I, I didn't get letters until, like, the end of, like, basic training. So, like, it, it emotionally, like, tore me down pretty much. I used to, like, cry in the middle of the night in the stairwell because, like, it was, it was really hard. It was really hard. Like, yeah, like, um, it was... Okay, okay. <laughs> And what, but, okay. but, but I'm thinking what she's saying is an yeah. experience that I had, as I told you earlier, I was in charge of basic training um, for, for soldiers for a couple of cycles. And for a lot of the young men, there is a family history, and they're encouraged yeah. and, and to join the military. But for most of the women that I've talked to out throughout my career, there were one or two reactions. Absolute horror, as right. you say your family had, or... Are you really okay? Are you really okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you really okay? So it's, there's not a general history of, of women feeling that we're encouraged to join the, the, and, and serve. Um, and so, yes, I understand exactly what you mean about that can be being kind of tough and not feeling like you've got, a, you've got a whole host of people behind you supporting you and encouraging you. And I just really want to give Tamika a round of applause for that. <laughs> You bet. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, I'm done being emotional. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, like, after I graduated basic training, so I, I felt like I was on top of the world. Okay. So, um, so like, as of right now, like, I've, I've been, like, so I work overnight. I work 10 to 6 every night. And I go to school right after. And I do homework right after. And, like, like the military just, t like, I just think back, like, what I had to suffer there. And I think back right now. I'm just, like, I can do this, like. Like, for me, like, I, I barely get sleep. I get, like, three hours of sleep each day. And, like, all I think is the determination and the motivation of, like, what I want to succeed in the future. And, like, the military helps me. Like, every time, like, I'm, I, every time I think about, like, oh, I can't do this. But I think about what I did in the military, and it helps me. So one of the things that, that you said to me on the phone, when somebody says, how do you do this, I live for the motivation. That's great. Okay, some questions from the audience. Uh, 
I know you guys are very aware of like military science with being in the military and being around a lot of people who've experienced a lot, whether it's being in the army, navy, or anything like that. And I was wondering, do you believe like not in like when you're in the army and everything like that, but out and about in the neighborhood and everything like that, do you believe we are at times of war with the things that's going on in the country, whether it's police brutality, whether it's with um whether it's with the injustice that's happening to black people in this country, do you believe we are at times of war? That's the first question. The second question is with the Colin Kaepernick situation. If you were in that situation, what would you do? Would you kneel or would you stand? With his reasoning for kneeling was the injustice, injustice of black people in this country. And I was wondering with all you guys, would you kneel like him or would you stand? Um, first of all, to your, to your point, every one of us up here on the panel has taken the military, taken something from the military and apply it on our day-to-day -day basis. The reason that Colin Kaepernick can kneel right now is partly because of everybody up here on the panel. The reason that everyone up here on the panel also is uh, we're here is because we want to be able to continue to provide freedoms for everyone that is sitting in this room, to include Colin Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. So do I agree or disagree with what Colin Kaepernick stands for? Doesn't even really matter. The ability that he's able to express his opinions is what really, really matters uh, from my perspective as well. Um, so asking us our individual opinions of how we feel about him kneeling is neither really here nor there. He can do it and he can continue to do it because of these people standing, sitting up here on the panel. And I, I just want to kind of piggyback on that and, 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 and concur with what you just said. And I, I would suggest that you think about it this way. There were a lot of African Americans in this country who were opposed to what Dr. King and the Freedom Riders were doing. They felt that was un-American and wrong. To the people who sat in at the Woolworths lunch counter, there were people who disapproved of what they were doing. There were people who disapproved of people in, in the South trying to get people registered to vote. They felt that was wrong. So I think you're exactly right. We have the freedom in this country to challenge the status quo, to ask questions, to protest. And I'm very proud to be able to um, to say that I'm, I was part of allowing us to continue to do that because we're not like some countries where you disappear overnight if you disagree with the things that your city or your, your local government or your state government is doing. People disappear. Things, are, things happen to them. That doesn't happen in this country. You can protest peacefully. You can express your opinion. And how, how you do that is up to you. Anybody else want to talk about this? Sure, we've had a theme here about teamwork and collaboration and patriotism. And there are different ways to attack a problem. And Colin Kaepernick used the method that was available to him to attack a problem. And I applaud him for his effort. But there are also equal ways. Uh, my friend here, we don't want him to talk, but he has talked about being able to change things from the inside out. And that's one way to look at that. There are those that have served in the military. We just heard the story about Jackie Robinson mm -hmm. and his efforts. So there are different ways to attack a problem. And I think it's up to each individual to determine what method best suits their capabilities and their, uh, their opportunities. And, and to add to that, there's something that I tell a lot of my mentees when they were in the military especially, or in my, my other profession, when they would get discouraged and say, I'm just, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna check out. I say, no, no, no. I'd say, if you are not at the table then you are on the menu. Let me say this one more time, and that's, that's going to being inside an organization. You can, it's very difficult to change an organization externally, but if you're inside, if you're at the table, one, you're not on the menu, and two, you are part of the people who are helping make that organization more diverse, bring different perspective to the table, and help the organizations prosper and make better decisions. You, you just made me remember one of my platoon sergeants had a saying to us. He said, it's difficult to lead from the back of the bus. You had a question over, over we, here? We have a question right here. Okay. Hi, my name is Rashonda Stevens. I'm a graduate of COD. My son attended COD for a few classes, and I'm proud to say that he's a friend of this young lady. I'm, I'm glad he has friends <laughs> of this caliber. Um, I'm also from the west side of Chicago, and... Um, 
worked for AT&T for many years, just did some different things right now in education and um, um, special education. My, my question to you guys, obviously she's experiencing and maybe you, the men have as well, the social and the um, emotional care that the military is providing. And so many people that are outside of the military, my brother um, retired Air Force as well, that deals with a lot of um, emotional struggles. Um, the VA hospital, what they are providing and are not providing for these people that are now outside of the arc of the military. What, 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 what do we have? What's available? What, where's that, you know, that family? Well, you know, I think that, you know, probably outside of a lot of our pay grades or certain experience, um, I personally, I think that um, the, the country uh, shortchanges uh, a lot of its soldiers, sailors, and airmen. Um, when they don't come out in as good a condition, sometimes mentally or even physically, as when they went in. Uh, I, I, I think there's a huge gap there. I mean, you can hear the discussions from throughout the country at the higher levels of politics, you know, the VA this and the VA that. I, I agree with you that, that it is an issue. Um, I don't think it necessarily should be the case that a social service agency or volunteer effort should be the, uh, the default position per se um, when the country doesn't live up to what I believe is its, is its, uh, its rightful place in, in making certain that, you know, persons who serve are taken care of. Um, I, I don't think you'll get any disagreement here on that, um, but. Yeah, I, I think that the, the VA cannot do it all, but there are also a lot of veteran service organizations, yeah. and I don't want to give a commercial for the, right. for the better known veteran service organizations, and there's some smaller ones in our community that are providing safe spaces for veterans um, who don't want to go to the to VA for whatever reason. There are a lot of other organizations that go out and, and we have a large homeless veterans population. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of organizations that are committed to going out in Milwaukee and in Chicago and other cities in, in, in the, 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 the tri-state area here um, to, to support those veterans who are kind of falling between the cracks. So I think it's a, I think it's a, 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 a network that is providing support is it perfect? No. But I think that, as I said, we have a lot of veteran service organizations that help people who need to get a assistance with, with um, rent, with um, counseling, with job training, with helping them find jobs and keep their jobs, getting them service, service animals or, or any kind of support that they need. Um, and I think we need to do a better job of communicating that to people because I think there's a lot of yeah. things people aren't aware of. Yeah. How are you? I'm honored to be here, first of all but I want to do a commercial for the NAACP. As president, we actively have a Veterans Affair mm -hmm. chair open, and we want to incorporate that into our branch. If any of you can help me and point me in the right direction, well, I would love to spend some time with you to try to fill that gap, because we know there's a need, there's a lot of homelessness, right. there's a lot of services that is being not filled. And at the NAACP, we're aware of it, and we want to fill that 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 chair, and then build that that committee together to try to move that that forward. Uh, yeah, I was uh, going to ask, seeing that we have different um, generations and also different branches of the military at, on the panel, how do you guys feel between the different branches? The overall change of morality as soldiers in general, as well as men and women of color in the service? Morality? You... Moral? Morality? The, the morality of the, that changed over morale. generations or of time. Is it, morale? Is it morale yeah, or morals? Morale. Sorry about that. Sure. So, morale. Oh. Uh, why don't we go down, because that's an, that's an interesting thing through the, through the um, generation. So we'll, we'll end up with a general. But Peter, why, why don't you start? That's an interesting question. I, I used to have a Sergeant Major, uh, and when I was in, uh, I used to ask him, hey, Sergeant Major, how are you today? And his question, his answer to me would always be, life is good, morale is high. <laughs> um, morale in the, in the military, I think, ebbs and flows to a certain extent. Uh, when I was in, I, I think it was kind of high, 
9-11 happened, everybody was very patriotic, going in the military was very in vogue. I can't say that's the case right now. It's just not the thing to do. Um, and I think the soldiers, the airmen, and, and, the, and, and everyone in the military also kind of ebbs and flows the same way to a certain extent as well. We reflect a little bit of what society, again, going back to what I said, don't get me, more, don't get me wrong, the, the military a lot of times is trailblazers as it relates to racial um, issues. But still, there's a long way to go even in the military. So I think especially as men and women of color, we, we look to the military f to be, continue to be the trailblazer, but at the same time we realize that there's a long way to go even from today's military leaders and what they can dictate. Are you, talking you know, I have, um, like I said, I came in the military in 1979. I have two sons who are... I'm sorry, so, so um, Peter, when, when did you come in? I came initially in 1997. Okay, so now it is 79, so okay, go ahead. Um, <laughs> Oh, don't worry about it. I'm, I, uh, I went in earlier than you did, Sherman. It's okay. I, I have two sons who are both military officers. Um, one's a captain in the Marine, and he's also an attorney. And, and the, uh, the other's a captain in the Air Force. And I also work with young men and women. Uh, I represent four schools in uh, Naperville to help kids, uh, young men and women, to get into the Naval Academy. So I see, I see them coming through, I hear their motivations, I get a feel for what it is that, that's the rationale for why they, they want to serve. Uh, and I'll say this to say, um, as a black American, you know, going back any number of years, the military was a rational and a reasonable and a sort of low-hanging fruit way to sort of get out of a situation whether you serve a patriotism, social reason, economic reason, educational, et cetera. That isn't necessarily the case today. Um, we came down from about, I don't know, three million or so um, uh, total um, force uh, back in the 1970s okay. down to about 1.2, 1.3 million yeah. today. Yeah. With that, and I'll get to this, the answer, with that came a, an, a lower numbers, increase in standards, less of, and, and even with the war on drugs going back in the early 1980s, a whole lot less people became eligible to even go into the military. Mm -hmm. It's not that easy nowadays to say you're just gonna walk into an enlisted shop, sign the papers and get in. So it's a little bit more difficult to even get into the military. The second piece of it is, is that uh, uh, the, those who do qualify uh, tend to have other alternatives as well. Yeah. In that they have other alternatives, the military may not necessarily be at the top of the list. So we have to attract people who are both qualified and want to get in. They tend to be people who are a lot more motivated. You know, for Annapolis, you know, not bragging on my school, it's the toughest school in the nation to get in, plus or minus, where we take about 7%, 900 of about 20,000 or so applicants a year. We look for the cream of the crop, the 4.0, 4.5, walk on water type students. And they have to have good moral uh, underpinnings and they have to have good academic underpinnings and be physically fit. And then we gotta say, are they a leader? Then we wanna say, are you motivated to serve? So we attract those kinds of people, both at the officer level, as well as at the enlisted level, the standards are a lot higher. So, um, that means that those who want to get in may not be able to get in, and those who we want to get in may not even want to come. So the rationale for why they go in are different. So and I, going to the point of morale, you know, I think I would argue that relative to my two sons who are still serving is that they had 20 different choices. Um, I think they're I think they're patriots and they chose the military as a path and they love it. And I see the young kids who I help to get and it's the same thing. I think the the morale in the military, I think if I would argue is pretty high. Yeah. Um but but you can see the barification and in availability versus um versus uh versus those who would have normally gotten in anyhow. 
Okay, let's let's keep on going down because we're running out of time here. Uh, sure. Felix? Real quickly, uh, from a morale perspective, I think there are different influences, whether it be political, social, economic, and depending on the era in which you were in. Um, when I was in active duty, uh, the trial of the century had just occurred, uh, and O.J. Simpson had went to trial, and his verdict had came out. And I distinctly remember we were in the middle of a cornfield in the middle of nowhere setting up a mobile secure wireless network and the <laughs> verdict came down and there was one group that was cheering and there was one group that was not and I know at that moment morale immediately shifted so I think that the economics the environment the conditions that a person is within drastically influence their perspective of the morale but when it all comes down to it their purpose of serving in the military and those common things bring those units together. So morale can have ebbs and flows depending on what's going on. Tanika, are you, are, you, are you wanting to answer that question about morale? Okay. <laughs> um, General, then I'll also wrap up. So okay. Um, to, to, to your point, um, we know at least in the Army that only one in eight youth can actually um, pass the tests and the physical requirements to join. So that's one out of eight. So n nine people can walk in, and maybe only one of them is actually going to be able to, as he says, meet the, meet the standards. Because those are the same kids that people are vying for to work at Home Depot, to, to go to college, you know, in any variety of careers. And as he says, it, yes, it is, it does depend in, in large part on the economics of, the, of, the, of that moment in time. But I say the people who do pass that test, who are able to, to make, who make the cut, to be honest, um, I think they are, they are dedicated, their morale is high, um, because they, they were, as you said earlier, they were, they were motivated to join. So let me just uh, um, <coughs> close up with this. It's a really complex question. Mm -hmm. Every military leader worries about that question. And there are various kinds of levels to it. So one level is, how does the nation feel about you? That helps with, our, with my sense of purpose and my sense of pride. How does my family feel about this or, or my friends closest to me? And then what is, the, what is my leader like about this? Because leaders matter. So the ebb and flow times, the, ebb, the ebbs and flows of morale based upon the individual leader who is affecting you in some fashion, the NCO for Peter James, you know, whoever it is, that person will affect your morale. Does he or she care about, about me and what I'm doing and my competency and my ability to do things and those kind of things? One is how, how, how do my social group feel about this? Do they think I'm cool and all that kind of thing? Or, and then how does the nation feel? All those things come into play and they're oftentimes not always even because your unit morale, based upon the leader, is nearly immediate, it's intimate, and it's knowable, it's, it's accessible. Everything else gets less and less and less under my control, and under my ability to do anything about it. So it's a, it's a complex question. That's why in this democracy, when civilians vote to send the military into combat, or when we know that there are, are military who are not in combat, but have to do other kinds of jobs, that this nation's ready to support that, which is really important. I want to thank the uh, panel very, very much. It's been a terrific time.